force is strong in my family. Force is strong in my family. My father has it. My father has it. I have it. I have it. My sister has it. My sister has it. You have that power too. You have that power too. In time, you'll learn to use it as I have. We would be honored if you would join us. And welcome to it. I am John Justice, and it is episode number 36 of the Star Wars My Nerd World podcast. I had a chance to go see Star Wars The Force Awakens again um, over the weekend, and it was such an enjoyable experience. Uh, That was number six for seeing it in the theater, and I guess the last time that I had seen it, I had family in town, and I was really uh, tired, which means... I think I might have been a little bit hungover. It was over the holidays, and I um, I, I just remember when, when we went to go see it, it was a long night before, and I was just, again, I was really, really tired seeing it. And so uh, I, I'd been wanting to get back to the theater to see it for a while. And I know it's not going to leave um, the, the, the movie theaters anytime soon, but it was just um, trying to find the right time. And... To be honest, yesterday really wasn't the right time. I try to go when the family's not busy doing things or try to get the family to go with us. And I had been attempting to convince my nine-year-old to go with me and my wife Melinda to go see it because that way, you know, Logan, my 13-year-old, could stay at home. I don't, I'm don't. i afraid to go out for more than two hours and have Logan watching Kyle for fear that neither of them are going to be alive by the time we get back. Uh, but as my 9-year-old um, shared with me, he'd already seen it twice in the theater and didn't really need to go see it again. So uh, he's more into Ninjago right now and uh, How to Train Your Dragon than he is Star Wars. Uh, but Melinda was cool enough to, you know, say, no, be, be gone with you. Go ahead and go watch it. And uh, so I caught uh, I caught an afternoon show uh, down the street from my house, and just I I love this movie. It is, and, and every time I see it, there is a new there's a there's a new dynamic that gets brought to the film for me. It's not as if I'm seeing something new, but there's a new vibe. And this time around was the first time seeing it where it truly felt as if it was a part of all um, of the other movies. And I know that may sound weird, but, you know, you watch the prequels and they all have kind of a common thread. You watch the original trilogy and they're different from the prequels, but they all have kind of of a common thread. The prequels don't necessarily feel, and they, well, they're not necessarily, they don't, they don't feel like the original trilogy. Um, But this movie definitely feels like it has that common thread to the original trilogy you know and fourth movies you know the the fourth movie in in any series is always kind of odd i think the only series that was able to um to move away from that was harry potter harry potter to me well and the james bond movies but those are a little bit different i mean those vary in themes and actors and whatnot you know the harry potter movies are very much a continuation of the storyline and those movies really feel like one big gigantic series and that they, they don't feel disjointed at all um you know again the prequels feel a little bit disjointed from the original trilogy when you look at like the terminator series those movies are all disjointed when you look at the alien series those movies are all disjointed um you look at well, I'm trying to think of other trilogies that have gone on to force. Oh, Pirates of the Caribbean, first three trilogy, fourth one didn't really feel like it was part of the series. Seeing Star Wars: The Force Awakens in the theater this time, it felt like a direct extension from the original trilogy. And again, it's a uh, it's a testament to the creators of that film that they were able to capture that vibe and that aesthetic. Just, I mean, they just nailed it. 
They absolutely nailed it. And I had just as much fun watching it. As a matter of fact, there was a moment in the movie. Well, there, I, when I got there, I was running late for one. And I was worried that um, I was going to miss the beginning of the movie. But at the same time, you know, I'd seen it five times prior. So I wasn't that worried about it. But, you know, you want to get the whole experience. You don't want to miss any of it. And I love the opening. I love all the movie. And this actually is kind of what I'm driving at. Uh, so I walked in right as the Lucasfilm logo was starting, which was really funny because the movie started at 1220 and I did not get in the theater until 1235, 1240, maybe. And, you know, still there were that many trailers, which was fine because I'd seen all those trailers before. But I walked in like right as the as the Lucasfilm logo popped on and I was just, you know, I was really excited. I was somewhat bummed out because they had moved it to a smaller theater. And I think it was one of the smallest theaters um, in the uh, uh, and, you know, at the theater I went to, which kind of bummed me out a little bit, but still, it didn't matter. Uh, but so the movie starts and thoroughly enjoying myself. And, and uh, it, was, it was pretty much a full house, but it was a smaller theater. And there was one point where I needed to go use the restroom. <laughs> and I suddenly found myself with a bit of a dilemma. You know, even though I'd seen this movie before, I mean, five other times, I didn't want to miss anything so i was trying to to decide what scene i wanted to 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 go use the restroom which was really dumb because the bathroom was right i mean it, the bathroom this theater was located closest to the bathroom of any other theater you know in the building and i finally decided that i was going to go um right after uh han solo captures the millennium falcon before right before they meet han solo and chewbacca uh, you know, I, I basically, I wanted to make sure I saw the exchange where Finn climbs up to look out the canopy, the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon, and he steps on Ray's head and Ray gets all annoyed. Get off. I didn't want to miss that interaction. And so I thought, okay, well, the Chewie were home. I've seen a gazillion times, so I can go and miss that particular part. The reason I bring it up, though, is because this movie is full of so much enjoyment in terms of scenes that you don't want to miss anything. My sister uh, is uh, is pregnant with their um, with their second child, and I've never been pregnant, won't ever be pregnant, but I know um, that that has a tendency to cause women to have to use the restroom a bunch because the baby is sitting on their bladder. So she had reached out to me. It's funny. This was actually after I'd gone to see it. I'd already come home. She had reached out to me and wanted to know, because this was the first time she was seeing the movie, what point she could go use the restroom. And I was kind of stuck. I'm like, I don't know what point to send you to use the restroom. I basically had to tell her, look, these are the action sequences. And so for fear of losing, you know, missing any of the pertinent dialogue and storyline features, I guess it's best for you to go during the action sequence sequences, which I feel bad for doing because the action sequences are awesome, but I'm a dude and I like spaceships. So that's what I told her to go do. But man, I really enjoyed the, I just I, I just I love this I love this movie so much. It is my favorite but by far. It is now my favorite of all the Star Wars films. And I, and I say that honestly because I'm a there's three things, well, okay, the three ancillary things in life that I love. Okay? Apart from God, family, work in terms of priorities, right? Although right now work's way down on the list cuz I'm not all that happy with my current job, but I won't get into that right. Actually, actually, I do have that as part of today's podcast, but I won't get into it right now. This is why I love doing this podcast, because it allows me to go and be my talk show host uh, self, talk about Star Wars in a venue that's all my own and not having to do it at work because I'm frustrated with my current state of employment at the moment. Thank, I'm thankful to the good Lord Almighty that I have a job, just not happy with the job itself. Um, now see, now, oh, 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 Star Wars being number one. Um, this is a, this is this is a true statement because apart from the things I just mentioned, the other things that I love, the ancillary stuff, uh, Star Wars, uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. NASCAR, I'm a huge fan of, and the band Depeche Mode, and I finally came to the conclusion that I had been unfair to myself and been judging Depeche Mode albums unfairly. Because usually when Depeche Mode releases a new album every four years, I end up saying that is my favorite album, and it's just not true, and I. It, it actually occurred to me this morning 
because um, through a series of circumstances, I had to go drive the truck around the neighborhood because Logan, my 13-year-old, drained the battery, charging batteries for his RC planes, and I had to go drive it around to recharge the battery. But be that as it may, I, I threw in um, the, the Depeche Mode album that came out before the last one, and I realized that I liked it more than the newest one, and then I realized that their older albums, like Songs of Faith and Devotion and Violator, I actually like more than the newer stuff. And I usually go and I say that I like their newest album the best. And it's just not true. I've been kidding myself. Not the case when it comes to Star Wars. This I, I love this movie. Because every single scene matters, and it's so much fun. It's so much fun to watch. Now, watching it this time, and last week I said I wasn't I was going to steer myself away from talking about Ray and her lineage. I finally decided that I need to stop speculating on this because we are not going to get an answer. We may not even get an answer in episode eight. Colin Trevorrow uh, mentioned in an interview recently talking about episode nine. He's the director of episode nine. Also did the uh, the small sort of indie comedy, uh, Safety Not Guaranteed, which is a really fun, enjoyable movie, and of course, Jurassic World. And J.J. Abrams has come out and said specifically that they know who they know who Ray's parents are. This is not something they're making up down down the line. They have decided who Ray's parents are going to be. Okay, so with that being um, said, we've kind of all speculated that we would find out in episode eight. Well, Colin Trevorrow seemed to hint that we may not even find out until until episode nine. And I and I keep telling myself I need to stop speculating on this because we're never going to hit the right answer until we see what the answer is. And right now it feels like everybody is out there putting forth their theories because they are fun to put forward. There's nothing wrong with that. But it seems like uh, even on a subconscious level, people are expecting that they are going to hit the right theory they're going to magically hit that. That's the theory. And then if somebody gets it right, then J.J. Abrams or Ryan Johnson, who's writing and directing episode eight, are going to come out and say, oh, well, you know, you, you know, Jose Schnell ended up uh, in his uh, Ray is a Kenobi uh, article figuring out that that is a, who her grandfather is. And so he's figured it out. That's not going to happen. So I've been telling myself to stop stop speculating who Ray's parents are and just enjoy the film. However, watching the movie yesterday, guess what I found myself doing? Speculating the whole time who Ray's parents are. Now, I do want to get into this a little bit because, well, I'm going to speculate. So here we go. So watching the movie yesterday, I uh, and I don't, I don't know what brought it about. I think it was when I was watching some of the, oh, I, I actually know exactly what it was. Okay, so here's, he, here's, here's what made me start thinking about it. On the Millennium Falcon. When we have the quiet moment after they get off of, of Han and Chewie's transport ship and the fight with the Rathars, and BB-8 shows them the map, and Han does his speech about, uh, you know, the Force, uh, a, a Jedi, the dark side, right? It's all real. Ray says something to the effect, and I don't know the exact wording, but she says, the Jedi are real? She didn't know the Jedi were real. So Luke Skywalker's been a myth and a mystery. She says that to Finn. And then she says to Han, the Jedi were real. So she didn't even know the Jedi were real. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because everybody is assuming that she was a part of Luke's academy. And that, and everybody has, not everybody, most people have made the jump, have jumped to the conclusion that we know for the most part, we know that Kylo Ren was being trained by Luke. We know that Luke started a Jedi Academy. We know that Kylo Ren turned on Luke, and we assume that Kylo Ren wiped out the Jedi Academy. Because the scene that we see in the Force back on Maz Kanata's castle and what we saw in the trailer of the Knights of Ren in the rain with all the bodies lying around, we are all making an assumption that that is the slaughter of Luke's Jedi Academy and that Luke 
um, with R2-D2 with his hand on R2-D2 in front of what we believe is a funeral pyre. 